I'd like to welcome everyone this evening to the Jewish Policy Center Forum. And I'd like to thank the Atlanta Jewish Academy and Rabbi Heck for allowing us to hold this event in this beautiful facility. I especially want to thank uh, Evie Weinrich, who uh, is an associate here, who was a great help to us in uh, getting this all set up for us. Thank you, Evie. I'm Chuck Burke, and I, uh, as I look out at the audience, I see many of you who I know from uh, other organizations I'm involved with, um, but tonight I'm operating my capacity as a member of the Jewish Policy Center. The JPC is a nonprofit, nonpartisan educational organization committed to policy analysis and education. And I hope you'll take a look at the, I think many of you picked up the In Focus magazine, um, you can pick up a copy on the way out if you haven't gotten one. And I hope you'll sign up to receive it on a quarterly basis. Uh, the current issue tackles some very sticky problems emanating from Europe 25 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall. You may remember, at least those of you who are old enough to remember, uh, that in the euphoria of the moment in 1989, uh, that the uh, people, many people had arrived at the feeling that we are at the end of history, when the world would move in a more or less straight line toward greater freedom, civil liberties, and democratic capitalism. Well, it hasn't quite worked out that way, has it? So let us know what you think of the articles. Let me tell you a little bit about the JPC. The JPC publishes articles and opinion pieces in the press and online. It sends speakers to synagogues, churches, universities, and civic groups across the country. It supplies expert information to other organizations working to support Israel and the U.S. Israel security. And it's developed an increasing presence on the web. You can follow the JPC on Twitter and receive the free insight and context emails as well as new offerings, Alliance Tracker and Frontline Defense. They're free and they show up in your mailbox on a regular basis. There's a card in the in-focus for you to provide your email address and please take the envelope as well and consider making a tax-deductible donation to the JPC. Of course, the other thing that the JPC does is it hosts all-star lineups like the one we have this evening. Tonight's forum concerns foreign policy priorities, specifically the current upheaval in the Middle East, what it is happening, why, and how the U.S. can make effective policy for our own security to help protect our friends and our allies and to punish our enemies. Sort of a modest mandate for you people to uh, solve for us this evening. So what I would like you to do now is I'd like everybody to raise their right hands and I'd like you to reach down and turn your cell phones off in your pocket or your... <coughs> so I'll give you a minute to do that. I usually forget. Mine rings with a, uh, it's the Godfather music, and I was making a presentation in, in front of the Georgia Senate back a few months ago, and 30 seconds into it, the, uh, my phone went off, so uh, I try to remember now. Uh, I'd also like to, you, many of you picked up a, a flyer on the way in for another event that's uh, going to be uh, right next door, basically, at Congregation Beth Tefila, which will be on Sunday night, the 2nd, in which they're going to have another uh, excellent panel talking about very similar subjects. And uh, the moderator for that will be George Birnbaum. Many of you know that George at one time was, uh, in the first term, was uh, Bibi Netanyahu's chief of staff. So he's a very interesting guy, and, and you may be very interested in going to that program also. Uh, now to tonight's evening's business. Uh, this will be a free-flowing forum among our distinguished and talented panelists. To accomplish this, we needed an experienced and extraordinary moderator, one who was quick on his feet, fully grounded in the issues, and equal to the panelists in scope of his knowledge and depth of his insights. Tonight we have one of the best. This evening's moderator is a scholar, an author, a film critic, a television interviewer, and a radio talk show host, Mr. Michael Medved. His, his three-hour broadcast is heard weekdays in Atlanta, and for those of you who don't know, it's on AM 920 between 3 and 6 p.m. 
and all weekdays. I'd encourage you to listen. It reaches more than two and a half million listeners on, a nearly, on nearly 200 stations across the country and is consistently ranked as one of the top 10 political talk shows in the United States. I'm proud to say he is also a distinguished fellow of the Jewish Policy Center. Michael will introduce the rest of the panel this evening's. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Medvin. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for everyone uh, and Hakadosh Baruch Hu for arranging this wonderful weather in Atlanta. I actually came uh, ill prepared because I brought an overcoat. I mean, <laughs> you come from the West Coast and arrived this morning, and we just did finish the daily broadcast not too far from here, which is where AM 920 is. In any event, um, let me let me proceed to introduce our our panel and then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to kick things around a bit and then we're going to open it up to uh, to your conversation and your questions and challenges and uh, that will be even more free-flowing. Uh, Jewish people and uh, friends of Israel generally are uh, not known to be shy and retiring, laid back, nor should you be. In any event, um, our, our guests uh, tonight include, uh, beginning with the one that I've known the longest time, uh, Dr. Jonathan Shanzer is the Vice President for Research of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Jonathan, uh, on, on my extreme left, but he's on your right. Um, and Jonathan was a director for many years of the Jewish Policy Center, and we worked on many panels like this one. Uh, he's been with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies since February of 2010, with responsibility for ensuring that FDD uh, delivers accurate and timely research useful to decision makers inside the Beltway. His books and monographs include State of Failure, Yasser Arafat, Mahmoud Abbas, and the Unmaking of the Palestinian State, Hamas versus Fatah, uh, or as it's known to science fiction fans, King Kong versus Godzilla, um, uh, Al-Qaeda's armies, and much more. He's testified before Congress, and he publishes widely in the American and international media. Dr. Jonathan Shanzer. Um, Next to Dr. Shanzer is Lee Smith, who is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. He is also a senior editor at the Weekly Standard, one of America's most important magazines. He uh, is also the author of The Strong Horse, uh, Power Politics, and The Clash of Arab Civilizations. It was published by Doubleday in January of 2010. Uh, Lee Smith uh, has his BA from George Washington University, and he has uh, also studied at Cornell and studied Arabic at the American University in Cairo and uh, in uh, University Saint Joseph in Beirut. He uh, knows Spanish, Arabic, French, and Latin, and I'm sure will regale us with all of these linguistic skills at some point in the evening. Uh, finally, Michael Eisenstadt is with the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, where he is senior fellow, and he is director of the Washington Institute's Military and Security Studies Program. Prior to joining the Institute in 1989, uh, Mr. Eisenstadt worked as a military analyst with the U.S. government. He served for 20 years as an officer in the U.S. Army Reserve before his retirement in 2010. His military service included active duty uh, stints in Iraq with the United States forces at Iraq headquarters and uh, the Human Terrain System Assessment Team in Jerusalem, the West Bank, and Jordan with the U.S. Security Coordinator for Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Now, I don't know if there's an acronym for those various organizations, but uh, his service obviously gives him also extremely valuable perspective on the Middle East. And that's our subject, subject for the night. I mean, I, I think that the, the title of the uh, lecture, which uh, Alex Siegel, the very capable director of the Jewish Policy Center, came up with was, The Middle East Erupts! 
And the good part of that is it's safe, right? Even if things change, it's, it still seems to apply. I, I mean, it would have been uh, uh, somewhat unusual to uh, reach a point where the Middle East wasn't erupting, where there wasn't some kind of assaultive uh, parade of bad news. So my first question for each of our distinguished scholars, and we'll begin with Jonathan Shanzer, is I'm hoping that each one of these gentlemen can share with us some truly one piece each, truly encouraging, positive, upbeat news from the Middle East. <laughs> Jonathan? Well, thank you, Michael, and, and great to be here uh, and to be back here with the JPC. Um, I think the one piece of good news that I would point out, and, and Lee, I'm going to apologize in advance because we talked about maybe trying to get through tonight without mentioning the Palestinians. Um, <laughs> but uh, look, the good news is, from my perspective, that Hamas is in a lot of trouble financially. Uh, this was actually why Hamas launched the war that it, that it did in the summer. Uh, things have been going very well for Hamas under the, uh, the rule of Mohammed Morsi, and they had really uh, been able to uh, smuggle more weapons, bring in more cash, uh, smuggle in more goods. Uh, when Abdul Fatal Sisi came in, and by the way, Sisi's you know, not exactly a wonderful person in his own right. If you've seen the movie The Dictator with Sasha Baron Cohen, it's pretty much a, a, you know, a spitting image. Um, but what CC did over this last year plus is he has crushed those smuggling tunnels. There have been more than 1,800 of them that have been destroyed. Uh, this has ensured that cash has not gone through, that weapons have not gone through, and more importantly, the goods aren't getting through either, and Hamas had been taxing them, and everything went through from food to clothes to golf clubs to Viagra. They taxed everything, and they took 20 or 30 percent off the top. That money has all gone away, and we think that their budget may, be, have, uh, may have been sliced by as much as 70 percent. So that's some good news. Um, Lee Smith. Uh, okay. uh, I, I, it's not that I was trying to avoid discussing the Palestinians, per se. I just thought it would be an interesting challenge, and also I thought it would be very telling about the, reading, about the, about the region if after an hour and a half, two hours, uh, audience members and panelists alike, we all looked at our wives and said, can you believe this? We've just been through two hours and no one has said anything about the Palestinians, which sort of suggests how many different challenges there are in the region now, from ISIS to the Iranian nuclear weapons program. There are... Uh, a lot of them to Libya, a lot of bad things happening. Uh, good news, I would say, I'm actually going to come up with an answer uh, analogous to Jonathan's. I would look at Lebanon, which is a place that I look at a lot, and I would say one of the, one of the strange positive aspects of the Syrian civil war, which I think we're not going to see it play itself out for a little while, but I think we can start to see this build is, is that with all the Syrian refugees who have gone to Lebanon, we're talking at least a million Sunni refugees, maybe two million. That has changed the balance of power in Lebanon so that while Hezbollah has been fighting in Syria for a little more than the last two years, then back home to their backs, they have real problem. And I think insofar as that can, uh, I think insofar as that can preoccupy Lebanon, preoccupy Hezbollah rather, and keep the Iranians also tied down in a certain way, I think that's good news. There's more, maybe there's more good news in the region, but I'll leave it at that for now. Michael. Well, Mike, you know, I uh, direct the military and security studies program at the Washington Institute, and I deal basically in death and destruction. So it's not, um, <laughs> I'm not used to answering this question. Business has um, been and good. It, and it's a very, very, it's a very low, it's a very low bar. It's a very low bar. I'll say uh, my, my girls are in Israel now at a seminary, and they're having a great time. So, and the country is doing very well. Um, but, um, I'm, seriously, I'm, I've just finished a study on ISIS, um, the Islamic State, so-called Islamic State um, in Syria and Iraq, and um, one of the conclusions is they've got great vulnerabilities. I mean, they're overstretched, and um, we are focusing on what's going on at Kobani and um, 
on the border with Syria uh, and, and Turkey, but there's a lot of areas that they're not be, they've not been able to hold on in Iraq because they've had to draw off their forces. They tend to overreach and alienate a lot of people, and we see signs of that happening, um, uh, more in Iraq than in Syria, at least at this point. They have a fractious coalition that is made up of many groups that have joined them for opportunistic reasons, and that creates a possibility they might abandon them for opportunistic reasons, maybe down the road, not quite yet. Um, their finances, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot has been made about them being the richest terrorist group in the world. Um, and maybe they were as a terrorist group, but now they claim to be a state. And to run a state, it costs a lot more money than to run a terrorist group. The Kurdistan regional government has an annual budget of 12 billion a year. They've got a, everybody says they earn one to three billion, um, maybe, oh, excuse me, one to three million a day from oil. And that's probably going down because of our military strikes. They're gonna have problems um, financially. And they're isolated and landlocked. And that doesn't, in, that, in terms of their long-term prognosis, it's not good. The problem is we don't have the ability right now to exploit those vulnerabilities, and that's why this is going to be difficult and long. But, but there are things on which we can um, grab onto and potential sources of vulnerability we could exploit. Okay. What, um, there, there seemed to be so much uh, enthusiasm, particularly on the part of the uh, current administration, about the so-called Arab Spring. Uh, would any of you gentlemen admit to being shocked that the Arab Spring has not uh, turned out to be exactly messianic in terms of its impact on the Middle East? Well, I'll just say one thing just to yeah. start things off maybe. Um, the, the game is not over in that regard. In terms of um, judging what the verdict of history will be, just give you a few examples. Egypt. First, it looked like it was a liberal le revolution waged by you know, liberal young people that was then captured by Islamists and then was displaced by, in a military coup by people who, um, you know, I, I think, at least from the point of view of, say, of Israel's interests, are mo a lot more uh, amenable to working with Israel to deal with common um, um, uh, you know, interests. Syria looked like they were, initially it looked like the Arab Spring was going to pass them by. And then you had these peaceful uprisings, which then grew bloody because of the way the government responded. Um, and there's a question now, the Gulf looks like it's been completely passed by by the Arab Spring. We don't know, or, or, or the Arab uprisings, we don't know how this is gonna play out. So we've, we've, got, we've gone through strategic whiplash. It looks like, originally it looked like um, Iran was gonna be the big winner of the Arab Spring, expanding their influence. Then it looked like, because of what um, happened in Bahrain and their intervention in Syria, it looked like then uh, uh, regional opinion was, um, uh, uh, was kind of, there's a backlash against them, and now it looks like they'll be able to exploit what's going on in Iraq to ex expand their inter interest um, and influence. So we've seen the seesaw, or the pendulum swing back and forth, and I think it's really too early to say how this thing is going to end up uh, and whether we're towards the end of the beginning or the beginning of the end of this process. Um, any, any, anyone uh, here who um, was surprised at the, uh, the lack of uh, democratization uh, associated with m most of the Arab Spring? We're, we're always told that Tunisia is a, uh, uh, the, the great exception. Uh, are things uh, truly that, that cheerful and, and uh, benevolent in Tunisia? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I won't speak about Tunisia, but I will. For me, looking at the Arab Spring, my, I had a number of um, issues. In particular, I lived in Egypt for a while, and I know the political energy of the country. So when I heard that people took to the streets, I was not concerned. And actually, I thought it was very surprising that so many American commentators and analysts were enthusiastic about this. This was not a replay of May 1968 in Paris, which in itself was not necessarily that pleasant. I'm a conservative insofar as I think that we need to be careful with uh, existing political institutions, that we need to be very delicate and figure out what these things really stand for, instead of just tearing these things down because we see something that we believe is charismatic and exciting. And to see what happened in Egypt, I think that should make us all a little more conservative, especially about change in terms of the Middle East. The one, uh, <clears throat> the one bit that I was enthusiastic about was the Bahrain uprising. And not because there was violence on the streets, but because there was an actual political document, there was a constitution that the people of Bahrain, both the 
Shia majority and the Sunni government had agreed on a charter, a constitution. And the way that I understood the uprising in Bahrain was we want this constitution that we agreed on, uh, that we agreed on more than 15 years ago now, what's happening. Every other, every other uprising, while some of them I cheered them on, I still think the Syrian uprising, if it can bring down Bashar al-Assad, is a good thing. But in terms of political movement, in terms of moving closer towards liberal democracies or different individual liberties, I thought the chances of that were extremely slight. Jonathan, um, there has been obviously heightened focus all around the world on the intensifying conflict between Sunni and uh, Shia Muslims. Um, is that a positive or a negative dangerous development for the United States and for Israel? Well, I think we should not be focusing on that as the primary conflict. Um, I think that, uh, let, me, let me put it this way, there are many issues that come out of uh, both camps. I mean, of course, the Saudis have been uh, uh, underwriting Wahhabism for uh, for several decades, and of course, are responsible for anything from uh, the 9/11 attacks to, I would even argue, uh, the Islamic State today. I mean, uh, they are part of the coalition fighting the Islamic State, but I firmly believe that were it not for the spread of Wahhabism over these decades, I don't think this phenomenon would have come about. And so this doesn't make them the good guys. On the other hand, you've got the, the Shiite bloc, and of course, that's Iran. This is uh, what I would say is the most dangerous regime on the planet, a state sponsor of terrorism that's got a track record a mile long, and now it's on the precipice of a nuclear weapon. There is no good guy here. And so in so much as they're fighting, I think it's a good thing. I think you once called it uh, alien versus predator. We should just open up a bag of popcorn and kind of enjoy the show. Um, but at, at the end of the day, um, there is no good guy in this battle when you think about what, the, what they're ultimately fighting for. Um, look, it could be useful um, to employ the services of one against the other, but one of the dangers that we're seeing right now, for example, is that as Iran is getting closer and closer to that nuclear weapon, they're coming to the United States and saying, look, if you need help in fighting ISIS, we're here for you, and then perhaps we might be able to give you that, and you can give us something else in return, make some concessions. That's not a deal I'm willing to make. If, if I could just jump in on this. Certainly. Um, during the Iran-Iraq war, I think Henry Kissinger was famous for saying, uh, too bad they both can't lose. Um, and I think there's a tendency to kind of, a good example is the Iran-Iraq wars, you know, some people argued at the time it was in our interest, um, in the American interest to see the war continue. Um, and my, my feeling at the time, and, and it's kind of uh, has influenced my, the way I look at a lot of these uh, fights in the region, is that actually the continuation of these kind of conflicts um, often is not, is, it's, it's a mixed blessing in that it keeps your enemies distracted. But what happens is that, for instance, during the Iran-Iraq War, Iraq was able to build up their weapons of mass destruction capability because uh, they were, um, and, and, and increase the size of their army larger than they would have been able to if they were at, at peace. They were able to mobilize the society in the ways that they wouldn't have um, under normal circumstances. And what we're seeing now as a result of this kind of um, cataclysmic or, uh, you know, fight, um, the mobilization, a, a degree of mobiliz a jihadist mobilization we've not seen ever before. Mm -hmm. During the Afghanistan fight, I think there were 5,000 jihadists who went, uh, many Arabs, to fight in Afghanistan and went back and kind of wreaked havoc when they went home. Um, Iraq, it was about 4,000. Now we've had in just uh, three years or so, 15,000, as, as best we know. And we, this is kind of metastasizing. If you also look back at Afghanistan and Iraq, it was geographically, it was a very limited pool of people they drew, drew from, mainly from the region. Now they're getting from all over the world. So that's why I, I am concerned. There's not really a lot we can do about this, I think. We have limited options. But I'm not sure it's, it's, this is the kind of thing you, you kind of just want to just let, you know, a pox on them and let them keep fighting. But there'll be, there'll be blowback. I was going to say, I, I, excuse me, um, I know I entirely agree with you. I, I look at what happened. I mean, we also remember what happened at the end of the Iraq, Iran Iraq war, and Saddam Hussein invent, in, invaded Kuwait, and the United States was forced to land troops. Um, so, yes, I think that both the administration, the chief of staff, Dennis McDonough, and the Republican Party, Sarah Palin, have both phrased it differently. Uh, you know, Sarah Palin let Allah sort it out, 
and, um, and with, uh, with the White House, it was, well, Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah fighting each other might be good for U.S. interests. I agree with Michael. I just don't see it like that at all. I think it's extremely dangerous. I think it destabilizes the region, and we see what happens, I believe, when the United States has a lower profile in the region. It's much, it's, it's much more dangerous, not just for the region, not just for American allies, it's worse for Americans as well. I mean, one of the issues with the Iranian nuclear weapons program is <clears throat> how much that will affect uh, how Americans live here at home in, in terms of oil prices and things like that. And stability in the Middle East is very bad for us. Uh, if, you know, if, I, if I may, I, um, I, I've spent some time, as I know all of you have, trying to figure out American public opinion, <laughs> which is uh, always an interesting study. Um, there appear to, to be some very, very obvious contradictions that exist in American public opinion toward the Middle East. There is now a, an overwhelming majority, it's more than two-thirds in, in polling consistently, that believe we need to take military action against ISIS. But then when people ask more general questions, uh, should America be more involved or less involved, with the affairs of the Middle East, there's an even larger majority that wants us to be less involved with the affairs of the Middle East. How do you confront, because I know each of you do in, in your different work, the, the very real tendency, and it's a growing tendency from many Americans, not all, to say uh, exactly what, uh, what Lee just echoed, which is, oh, let God sort it out. Uh, they're killing each other. They've always been killing each other. Why should we be concerned? Why should we be concerned, Jonathan Chancer? Look, the, the, the line after the Bush administration was that we had been overactive. We had a hyperactive foreign policy. And as a result of all of our meddling and all of our activity, we had found ourselves in two, maybe three wars, depending on whether you call the war on terror a front, uh, and that we had uh, hundreds of thousands of people killed, uh, we had loss of treasure, um, and we had ourselves a quagmire that we wouldn't be able to fix. Well, then we saw a swing in the American public, right? You had Barack Obama start stumping on the idea of hope and change and the idea of, uh, of getting out of wars. I mean, this is the way he framed it, right? That I, I got elected to get us out of wars, not to get us into new ones. And the idea was that we could essentially pick our enemies. We could choose who we fought with, and perhaps if we didn't fight Al-Qaeda, well, then they wouldn't fight us. And if we didn't want to tangle with the Iranians, well, then maybe they would just back down. We had the outstretched hand, which, of course, they slapped. But more importantly, when you look at what happened over these last six years, by getting out of the Al-Qaeda business, out of the counterterrorism business, other than, of course, taking out Osama bin Laden, our pivot away from the Middle East has arguably created a situation far worse than what we left. I mean, when you look at the numbers right now, the 200,000 people that have been killed in Syria, and the unofficial numbers, which are roughly double that, if you talk to the average Syrian, they will tell you that there are far more that have been unaccounted for. You're looking at numbers that have exceeded the death toll in Iraq. So what we've done is we've gone on a, a, a pretty tough pendulum swing. My thinking has always been that America appreciates a more centrist foreign policy, perhaps something that falls in the middle of these two approaches, but certainly does not step away from the region, because I think when, we've done, when we do that, and I think as Lee just said, it is extremely dangerous. There looks like there's no one in charge any longer, and so you've got these bad actors who are taking advantage of the vacuum, and that cannot be allowed to happen. Uh, Lee, you wrote a book called The Strong Horse, uh, which of course reflects the comments of uh, Osama bin Laden, Yamak Shamo, whose name should be blotted out. Um, and does the United States uh, seem to be the strong horse in world politics at the moment? Um, no, it's not, and people in the Middle East understand this. People see it pretty clearly. I, 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 I'll swing back around to this in a second, but I, I just want to make one of the points that I make in, in that book is one of the reasons that the Middle East, or the most important reason that the Middle East is important uh, for the United States is because of, because of the energy resources. And when we talk about, and it's not us, it's not strictly us, as, as I'm sure many of you know better than I do, most of our energy resources are not fulfilled through the Persian Gulf anymore, and we're moving uh, closer and closer, not towards energy independence, but less and less um, energy 
uh, being energy reliant on others. Nonetheless, as I'm sure many of you also know, oil is a global, uh, global market. If there is instability in the Middle East, if there are problems, this is one of the issues with the Iranian nuclear weapons program. And it's not just the Iranians. If the Iranians get a nuclear weapon and then the Saudis proliferate next, what's that going to look like? Every time you have an IRGC commander who's going to be screaming at a Saudi ambassador somewhere in the Middle East, it's going to tip the price of oil. And that will affect our allies and it will affect the way we live here. So just very simply, that's what then there are a number of other interests, of course, that are important. Um, certainly our various allies throughout the region, stability, namely for Israel, other allies, uh, other, al other allies that we should probably be reining in, but this is one of the issues that we need to show guidance and we need to show leadership in the region, and if not, there is big problems for the United States and global instability. So, yes, that's basically my take to show, um, as you started with before, um, to reward your friends, your allies, and to punish your enemies. Michael, uh, why should Americans uh, concern ourselves and invest our resources and even our lives of our young people in uh, some of the ongoing destruction and devastation in the Middle East? You've been there. Yeah, I'll just kind of echo the uh, kind of uh, the comments made by uh, the other uh, panelists, um, and, and I kind of uh, often say that. Um, you know, some look glibly, but I mean, I, actually, it's, uh, I'm serious, that if you don't visit the Middle East, it will visit you. Um, and that v many, many presidents have tried to ignore the Middle East, um, and uh, either in, in the context of, in, in the current president, a rebalance towards Asia, or in the context of just kind of, uh, you know, America come home and, and you know, kind of focusing on uh, you know, domestic uh, issues. And the problem is mid the Middle East always imposes itself in ways that are often um, um, put at risk um, vital American interests. So it's very important for the United States to be involved um, in shaping the region in ways that um, advance American interests. But the challenge is, you know, I think Jonathan meant, mentioned the whole issue of the pendulum, finding the right, the happy medium, you know, the shvil hazahav, you know, kind of the, you know, the, 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 the golden mean, not to, invade and occupy with 150 soldiers or not to ignore the region and hope it'll go away. But find the right way to sh you know, work with allies, acting independently when necessarily and in the context of coalitions um, when, when possible, to shape the region. Um, while, and while understanding we have a limited ability to do so, but that does not free us of the obligation uh, to try. I just wanted to just touch on the, on the polling data just for, for a moment. Um, because very often you get the, po the polling results you get depends on how the questions are framed very often. Of course. Um, and I think the death of um, Foley and Saltloff, the two journalists who were killed there recently by ISIS, murdered recently by ISIS, um, had a big uh, psychological impact on, on the American public. And what I think the American public has to understand, and I think this is very important for this administration to do, and, and the president has been saying it, but the problem is I'm not sure, it, it's, it doesn't come across that he believes it. This is going to be you know, after 9-11, we talked about the long war and in, that this is a generational struggle. And it really is. It really is that um, we need to be involved in this part of the world for many years to come. Um, and because, our, because this is not going to be resolved easily or quickly because of the reasons I explained before. We, you know, the, our enemies have vulnerabilities and weaknesses, but our friends are also, or at least our partners, they're not always friends, but our partners are very, are very weak as well. And therefore, um, short of going in with 150,000 troops on the ground, which, by the way, also experience shows only gets you short-lived results, you have to find a way to do it with minimum expenditure of blood and treasure, but enough in order to safeguard our interests. And, and, and hitting that right balance, we've not, we've not been very good. That's Maybe we can get some suggestions from uh, each of the panelists, or at least from uh, uh, two of you. Um, about another problem that's been very much in the news and, and certainly was in the news leading up to this session tonight. We had a situation in Ottawa, Canada, where <laughs> Ottawa, up until the tragic killing at the War Memorial, the city of Ottawa had five murders all year, this year. Five. Uh, a young and very recent convert to Islam, uh, Michael uh, Zehaf uh, Bibo, 
uh, goes on a rampage, commits murder, and actually gets into the parliament building where apparently they are now reporting he was a few yards away from the prime minister. Serious matter. And two days before that, in Quebec, a, uh, another recent convert to Islam named Rouleau uh, runs over two soldiers, kills one of them, and then the day after the Ottawa attack on the streets of New York City, uh, there's a gentleman named Zale Thompson, another recent convert to Islam, um, who attacks uh, four police officers uh, with, a, with a hatchet, uh, seriously wounding two of them. This um, all happening in a, a small cluster of time raises a question. Is there something that the United States and our allies should be doing differently to prevent the development of what people call a lone wolf uh, terrorist? And by the way, I don't like the term lone wolf because wolves have a positive image. I mean, really, think about it. Wolves are sort of romantic and strong and and uh, these are lone loons, uh, but that's not right either because they're more dangerous than loons. What, what should we do to, uh, prevent, to prevent this development uh, of, of young people raised in Canada and the United States, raised in every Western country, from embracing radical Islam and potentially killing some of their neighbors? I wish I had a, 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 a more optimistic answer for you, but I, I think the answer is essentially nothing, Michael. Um, it's very hard to track the lone wolves, lone loons, whatever you want to call them. Um, look, when you have a group of people who are conspiring, a terrorist organization, it's easy enough to tap their phones, check their emails, and try to find out what they're up to. When someone's talking to themselves, it's a lot harder to figure out what's going on. And look, that's essentially what some of these people were, were up to. Except this, this guy, Zale Thompson, I, did, have you seen his website? I did not. His website is full of uh, Quranic quotes uh, in Arabic and English uh, about kill the crusaders and kill the infidels. And, uh, and he has pictures of himself in a baklava holding a, a weapon. And he's announcing, basically, that he's getting ready to do something. I mean, where's the NSA? I thought they were supposed to be monitoring all this stuff. <laughs> and, and w would it not be appropriate? E even when, when you post it on Facebook, um, I, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be appropriate to be on top of this? Well, look, I mean, there are people who are monitoring these issues on Facebook, on Twitter, and there are uh, procedures um, and protocols that they go through, but they're trying to make sure that there's freedom of speech. It becomes one of these very tricky things. But look, more importantly, I think it's important, it, it's crucial to point out that our culture right now is we're trying not to look at Islam as the problem. We're trying to pretend that this is something else, right? We're fighting violent extremism. We're not fighting radical Islam. Look, we have a problem. There is a strain within Islam. I'm not going to say it's Islam per se, but there is, let's say, a 20% uh, of, of the religion that is embracing this on some level, whether it's Al-Qaeda, it's the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and, and this is a dangerous strain. Look, the good news is it's a minority. The bad news is, is that when you think about the number of people in the world who are Muslims, right, one8 billion people. You're looking still at 360 million people, about the population of the United States. It becomes extremely difficult to track everyone, and nor would the United States be inclined to do so. But I do think there is a little bit of a phobia of looking into Muslim activists and the things that they say. There's a lot of sensitivity about this that's developed over the years. I mean, Wait, I, I, I certainly agree that the police work, um, whether it's uh, the FBI or whether local police, and I think this is certainly true. They should be monitoring, monitoring um, social media, whether they should be doing, as the NYPD has done, doing different work in local mosques and working with community leaders. I think these are all very important things. However, I, I have to say, I, 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 don't, I don't think it's helpful. Uh, I don't think it's helpful in terms of policy to put the question in terms of Islam. Among other reasons, the first reason is because if you look, for instance, this is one of the, this is one of the, uh, you know, one of the sound bites that people keep coming up with ISIS. Well, they're so extreme. Even Ayman Zawahiri thought they were too extreme. This is not the issue. Okay, they're not too gross for Al Qaeda. This is part of the regional norm. 
A lot of these guys, as, 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 a, a, a lot of these guys come from Bathy backgrounds. They're secularists. As some of you may recall, some of the outrages and depredations of Bashar al-Assad and his Syrian regime is every bit as bad, if not worse, than the crucifixions and the decapitations of ISIS. So while this is vicious and ugly and horrible, I think to tie it to Islam, again, it's misleading. It's part of a regional norm, which we can all agree is horrifying. In terms of policy, how do you make this work? I think one of the things that you should do is you should target people who embody extremist causes. And this is one of the things that American policymakers again and again pay lip service to moderates and want moderates to stand up and take a stance against, against extremists. Well, you know what? Some moderates have taken a stance against extremists, and the United States has done nothing. Rafi Hariri, the former prime minister of Lebanon, was assassinated February 14, 2005, by Hezbollah and by the Syrian intelligence apparatus. As of yet, the perpetrators have not been brought to justice. Hariri embodied the so-called moderate Muslim. But what's happened again and again across the Middle East, both the Bush administration and the Obama administration have let moderates get shot at and killed. When we had a chance to, to we had a chance to back rebels in Syria, and I'm not saying that these were Jeffersonian Democrats, but certainly relative to the way a lot of the Sunni groups now look in Syria, these were moderates. When the United States had a chance to go back and use a fundamental Cold War tactic of backing proxies to take down an extremist group, we didn't do it. So a lot of it has to do with policymakers. And again, I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's just really not helpful when we look at it strictly in terms of Islam. Well, Lee, in fairness, you know that the reason that the United Nations and the uh, UN Human Rights Commission didn't do anything to prosecute the killers of Rafi Kariri is they were much too busy uh, dealing with all of the terrible, terrible things that Israel is doing, um, which seems to be their sole focus. Um, those are extremists they're going after. Yeah. yeah, those are the extremists they want to go. Spe and speaking of the extreme, uh, the, the Secretary of State of the United States uh, recently suggested uh, that the rise of ISIS was tied directly to uh, Israeli settlement policy. <laughs> Uh, in the region. Uh, would, would anyone here care to comment? <laughs> I will. I will. Why, why not? I'll, t I'll take this one. Look, it's one of, I mean, it's one of, this is, this is the common wisdom of how many generations of American policymakers. And I, I usually put it like this, well, right now the peace process has entered its mannerist phase. It's absurd. <laughs> Nothing makes any sense. So this is why someone like John Kerry is saying something like this. And of course, there's no connection. It's preposterous. And it's been this way for a long time. And when other American policymakers have said this, when other American policymakers have said it was laughable then, as it's laughable now. The difference now, I would say, there was one thing about the peace process. The, one, the way that the peace process needs to be seen is it's a token of American power. What that was, it was the United States, starting with Henry Kissinger, telling the Arabs, if you want something, you have to come on bended knee to us. If you want something from Israel, if you want negotiations, if you want this and that, you have to come to us. So it was a token of American power. And now, if you look at what's happened, it's not just the peace process has fallen, uh, fallen apart, but again, the United States has withdrawn so far from the region, it's hard to know what are symbols of American power now. The peace process, for all, for all of its many flaws, for all of its absurdity, it has been in the past a sign of American power. What um, would you rank as the odds or the chances, uh, if any, of a successful negotiation for a two-state solution in negotiations uh, led by, sponsored by the United States? Right now, I mean zero, um, <laughs> but but look, I think it's, it's very important that the United States be seen as engaged on this issue, though at a level below that of Secretary of State. I think it's very, very important for the United States to be actively involved. Um, I'm, I'm in favor of, you know, there, there's a lot of things that ha could be done, um, you know, in terms of economic development, um, improving the um, conditions of life for the Palestinians in the, in, in, in the West Bank and now in the wake of what happened in Gaza, in Gaza as well. 
Um, and it's important that the United States be engaged in that, A, to shape, um, shape developments. Also, look, um, you know, one of the things I did when I worked um, in Jerusalem with the U.S. Uh, security coordinator, uh, and, and this is, you know, this is my own personal view, but um, for understandable reasons, the Israelis, after the Second Intifada, which really kind of wound down around 2005, 2006, they probably could have moved quicker to ease restrictions on the Palestinian in the West Banks, which a lot of people don't realize how onerous those are. Um, they were imposed for good reasons and for understandable reasons, but there's a need to adjust quickly sometimes. And for bureaucratic reasons and for political reasons, it's not always done. So there are areas where I think we need to work with the Palestinians and the Israelis to improve quality of life for as long as there is no you know, possibility of anything happening on the political level, that the two people have to live together and they have to find a way, you know, any, any of you who have been there know, they live cheek by jowl. And you have to find a way to minimize friction. And that's why also, I'll, I'll just say, the whole idea of, of settlements, while I'm not ideologically opposed to it, I think it would be desirable for there to be some kind of freeze, however you define it, simply because it has become now, uh, for Israel, um, a focus of international opprobrium. And they don't do themselves any service by every time the U.S. Secretary of State goes over there announcing them. So I, I think that, you know, it, it's a matter of uh, using sechel and, and using, you know, common sense and doing the right thing. Um, but I don't think there's any chance of any kind of, uh, you know, forward movement in, in terms of a, uh, you know, settlement writ large. But you have to find a way to enable the people to coexist under the, uh, under the circumstances as best they can. Jonathan. Look, I would also agree that there's zero chance. I think right now with America as weak as it is in, in the region, there's no one who could step up to broker this. But even if the United States was operating on all cylinders and had the ability to bring both sides to the table and to demand concessions and commanded the respect of everyone else in the region to orchestrate this, it still wouldn't happen. And not because of settlements and not because of BBs and transigents. It's, it actually comes down to Palestinian politics, which I think is one of the most overlooked uh, issues in, in the Middle East. For all of the mounds and mounds of paper devoted to the, the Middle East, no one bothers to look at the Palestinians themselves. It's a political system that goes completely ignored. And there are two incredibly important things that you need to understand about the Palestinians right now. One stems from the fact that there was a civil war that took place in 2007. It was a war in which Hamas took over the Gaza Strip by force. They pushed people off of tall buildings to their death. They shot people in the legs and arms to ensure permanent disabilities. It was a war that lasted for several weeks. At the end of the day, when the dust settled, Hamas was permanently in charge. We can call it Hamasistan is what we have over there right now. And then on the other side, uh, there was West Bankistan. And they had two of everything. I mean, uh, as Aaron David Miller calls it, it was the Noah's Ark of the Palestinians, where you had two different governments, two different economic systems, two different educations, ev everything was different, and it still is that way today, despite the fact that there have been discussions of a unity government or, or uh, some reconciliation between the two. But then let's just say that, let's just say that a unity government was reached, and it was led by Mahmoud Abbas. Now, most people don't know this. Everybody talks about Abbas as this great moderate who can deliver. So look, first of all, everybody knows that he's not exactly a moderate. The guy wrote his dissertation on, on how the Jews collaborated with Hitler to help create the state of Israel. But th that's, not I mean, that, that's not important for, for the, our purposes here. I just always, it drives me a little bit crazy when people talk about him as this wonderfully moderate guy. But the point is that, that I want to make is that the guy's not a legitimate leader of his own people, that those elections that led to the conflict in Gaza in 2007, he, his party lost, okay? Abbas right now is nine years into a four-year term, okay? <laughs> this is not a guy who's going anywhere. He's become a dictator, just like anyone else in the region, just like uh, Mubarak or any of the, of the guys that we said were problematic and needed to go. We've not held the Palestinians to those same standards. And so now what you have is a very corrupt and ossified autocracy that is not respected by the people. And even if you had a deal that was struck, the Palestinians would not trust it, not because Israel shook hands on it, but because this guy that is still in power off after all these years does not sway his people at all. And that's incredibly overlooked and incredibly important. This, like, this is in contrast to Assad, of course, who was just re-elected fair and square. Right, exactly. And it, it internationally recognized 
model election. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, in a, in a few moments, we're going to be taking questions from the audience. So folks who have questions, you can line up uh, at the microphone right there. And first, let me conclude um, this portion of the program by asking each of you to put on your prospective historian's hats. Uh, all of a sudden, you're writing uh, a history of, of this period of time uh, from the perspective of 2024. It's 10 years from now. What happened between 2014 and 2024 regarding Iran and its nuclear program? What's the outcome, Michael? Um, the outcome will probably be that we still don't know exactly where Iran stands with regard to its nuclear capabilities. Ten years from um, now. P possibly, possibly. Wow. Well, I, I would just draw a parallel with um, uh, North, North Korea. North Korea. Well, I didn't say that they didn't have it, uh -huh. but it, the, its status would be unclear. Um, keep in mind, Iran's plan A was to have a with clandestine parallel program that they originally had a secret secret facilities. And I think they would have liked to have done like what South Africa did in the, during the Cold War to produce a handful of nuclear weapons with, and, and, and have nobody know about it and produce them in the event of a crisis. Now they were discovered, so they're on plan B, which is to build up their overt capabilities, um, become a threshold nuclear state. They would, like to res they would like to resurrect the clandestine program if they could do it without getting caught. But with Stuxnet and all that, I'm not sure they feel comfortable that they could do it without getting caught. So it's quite possible that in 10 years from now, they have a much larger overt infrastructure. We don't know whether they've actually resurrected their parallel clandestine program. And it's like North Korea in kind of like the, the mid to late 90s or, or so, we don't really know. We, we're pretty sure that they're, they're going in that direction, but we don't really know for sure. So it's kind of a, a gray, gray region. You, you think it is unlikely that there would be a um, military strike by either the United States, Israel, or both? Well, not this, not this administration, the U.S., and even in Israel, I'm not quite sure whether, look, the Israelis have walked up to the edge of the precipice and looked down. And um, the reason why they've been kicking this can down the road is because of all the um, risks that they realize that that course of action entails. So it is inaction, though, from their point. And, and they're kind of agonizing over it. So I don't take it as a foregone conclusion that they will do it if, you know. Um, now, if Iran overtly is foolish enough to try to make a dash overtly, which I don't think is their style, but I won't rule out, maybe they launch that. Lee. I, I, think the, I think one way to look at it is that the Iranian nuclear uh, weapons program is just another asset in the Iranian's arsenal. I think it's a much larger project than just the Iranian um, than just the Iranian bomb, and if you look right now, it's kind of it's it's kind of hard to tell. I mean, I might defer to Michael, who might have a little better sense of the actual military campaigns on the ground with the Iranians. But one of the things that we see happening, the Iranians now control four Arab capitals. They control, in addition to Beirut and Baghdad, they also control Damascus, and now they control Sana'a as well. This is a big deal. It's an expansionist regime. It's very serious. And if you look, you go from Iran, you go all the way from the Persian Gulf to Eastern Mediterranean, the Eastern Mediterranean, aside from a large block of tribal lands controlled by, uh, largely controlled by the Islamic State. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of hinterland there, too, that's uncontrollable. But a lot of that important territory is controlled by the Iranians. This is an issue, and it's getting more and more serious. So, Again, I think it's important not just to be concerned about the nuclear weapons program and what happens in 10 years, but what happens if the Iranians start to solidify these gains? What happens if part of the settlement in Syria is, as the administration has said, as I believe General Allen may have said today in an interview, I think it was General Allen, who was talking about looking at Iranian positions both in Syria and in Lebanon and Iraq. Uh, the more they're given, I think the more dangerous it is for the administration, the more dangerous it is for the region. The other thing I'll say right now, where we see uh, Israel with Iran on three of its borders, in Gaza, um, in Lebanon, and uh, not quite yet in Syria, but almost in Syria. And that, that's a big deal. So the Iranian project is comprehensive. Jonathan. Yeah, first of all, I, I agree absolutely with Lee, and I think it's important not to take our eye off the ball. Um, and 
it's also important to remember that the Iranians are, are truly playing a game of chess, and all of these different assets represent different pieces on the board for them. I fear that we're playing checkers. Um, the, um, I would say a couple of things here. One is that in terms of the deal that is supposed to be struck um, on, by November 24th, there's a high likelihood that we're going to kick the can down the road again. But the one thing that my organization, FTD, has been looking at is um, the sunset provision. So let's say a deal is made. It could expire after a certain point in time, and then the Iranians would be uh, welcomed to uh, pick things back up again exactly where they were. And so a lot of what happens over the next 10 years is going to be about the deal that we make. And the deal that we've made so far, these interim deals, I think have been woefully inadequate. We basically paid the Iranians roughly $11 billion and then a huge amount of money that you can't see because you're looking at this uh, revival of the Iranian economy based simply on psychology, right? I mean, markets are all about greed versus fear. Fear is receding, greed is creeping in, and we're seeing that the Iranians are slowly getting back up on their feet. And so I think we've made a lot of mistakes along the way. I fear that we don't make new ones. Um, two other notes about the, the horizon. Um, last year I had the opportunity to sit down with a, I'll just say a senior Israeli uh, official who told me about um, something that he called the shopping list. This was something that the Israelis were asking of the United States, not doing it through congressional channels, but actually military to military. And the assumption was is that if they got whatever was on that list, and of course if he told me he was going to have to kill me, um, but if, if the Israelis got what they wanted, then they felt comfortable that they would be able to uh, handle the military component. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the traditional means of flying overhead and refueling a couple times and pounding things with, uh, with massive ordnance penetrators. But nevertheless, there was a sense that maybe there was something that the United States and Israel could do <laughs> together. My assumption up until now is that the Israelis didn't get what they wanted because we've obviously not seen action. The final note here, and this is an optimistic one, but look, um, when you look at Israel, Israel is not a, it's not a world power, right? Its military is not, it's not world class, not like the United States, okay? It is a very, very good regional power uh, that I don't think is necessarily right now capable of doing the job that we're talking about, military bases. There's one area where I think the Israelis are a world power and that's in the area of technology. Uh, if you're talking about a 10-year horizon and the Israelis have an opportunity to plan for something over 10 years, I think it's reasonable to assume that the Israelis might be able to derail more of this Iranian program, like with Stuxnet or the Olympic Games virus, without firing a shot. All right, let us uh, uh, go so that we, we um, uh, proceed on time. Uh, running things not at Jewish standard time, but German Jewish standard time. Um, uh, your questions, you can just say your first name and then, and then ask the question. Uh, my name is Tom. I'm, a, I'm just a southern ignorant redneck boy. I've got a question for you <laughs> prefaced by a statement. God it buggers, bless you. <laughs> uh, it buggers the imagination of clear-eyed people uh, to believe that Islamo-fascist tendencies are represented by only 20% of the Muslim world. It's absurd, number one. My question, continued American emphasis and engagement in the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, to me, to a great extent, continues to provide legitimacy to murderous forces on one particular side of that engagement. Any thoughts? Well, the, the question was, he's suggesting that, on the, on the one hand, he's suggesting that it seems that the, um, the estimate of 20% support for Islamism um, is low. And uh, the second point that um, uh, Tom is making is that, uh, that the United States engagement in uh, diplomatic efforts between uh, Israel and the Palestinian Authority or between various Palestinian representatives ends up conferring legitimacy on, uh, I believe he's suggesting, uh, Palestinian organizations that don't really deserve it. Well, I can take a stab at, at some of this. First of all, the 20%, um, look, it's a rough estimate. It's not like, um, you know, the 
Pew folks are, are going around uh, door to door in, in you know, uh, ISIS controlled territory and they figured out that 20% supports ISIS and 80% don't. Um, what I can tell you is that this is a number that we've been debating for quite some time. And when we talk about Islamism, I'm talking about with the 20% we're talking about kind of hardcore uh, supporters of Islamism, not, you know, let's say people who believe that Islam should uh, be the best religion or the dominant religion in the world, which of course is troubling in its own right. Uh, but in terms of people who are uh, either uh, supporting uh, jihadist organizations through money, uh, through politics, uh, or through military means, this is the best available number that we have based on discussions with most, multiple pollsters, people who try to get access in the Middle East. I can't say that they're getting the best information, but it's what we're working with. It could very well be more, it could be less, and I think you know we continue to try to get our hands wrapped around this. Um, look, as for uh, the Palestinians, I, I, I've got a book outside, actually the bookseller wanted me to uh, remind everybody that it's for sale, so here it is. Um, <laughs> And, and these books will be personally signed. We have a, a, a number of authors here with a number of books, and the books will be personally signed and inscribed to you as soon as we conclude uh, this evening on time. My, my book is a lot less inexpensive than Jonathan's. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's a quicker read, too. It's really <laughs> well, I can't compete with that. Um, <laughs> um, uh, look, on the, on the Palestinian issue, I've, I've said this for a long time, uh, that reviving terrorist organizations or, or propping up terrorist organizations to become political organizations that ultimately uh, negotiate peace is not the right model. Uh, you know, the fact that we took the PLO and tried to spin it into some kind of a government uh, explains why we've basically just blown through billions and billions of dollars that they've wasted it. It's gone into the, into the pockets of corrupt officials that these people have never pulled the trigger, despite the fact that the deal that we're looking at today is essentially the deal that we had under Barack. It's the deal that we had under Omert. They keep rejecting it, and then they keep pointing to the Israelis talking about settlements, which are growing at a natural pace. Again, this is not to say that I condone settlements, or I think they're wonderful, but they're not the problem. The problem is, is that you've got a bankrupt leadership. We need to get the old Abus out. There needs to be a Martin Luther King, a Mahatma Gandhi, somebody you can rise up from within the Palestinian population that can capture the imagination of the Palestinian people. They've not done that, primarily because Abbas will not even allow for the formation of new political parties. If you, if you start to criticize him, you will, on Facebook, you can be thrown in jail under an archaic law that says that you can't criticize the King of Jordan. I'm not kidding that this is one of the things that, that can happen. And so there is just no political space right now within the Palestinian uh, 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 political system to allow for the growth of anything else. And so the Palestinians are stuck suffering under this guy that, as I mentioned, is now nine years into a four-year term. Okay, next question. So as a follow-on, I'd like to ask you about Jordan. Um, we're, all three of you, what's going on in Jordan, especially with the influx of refugees from Syria, with what's happening in Iraq next door? And the prize for Israel is the West Bank. It was absurd to ever think that Gaza under Egyptian rule and, and West Bank under Jordan rule was ever going to be a viable state. So is it any possibility, I'm thinking, of reviving the Elan plan? Because essentially the security fence is the ideal border for Israel, isn't it? And then, so seriously, let's talk about Jordan's part in all this. So, look, the idea that Jordan is Palestine comes up pretty much everywhere I go. I, I um, didn't say that. It, no, no, but I mean, it's a, it's, you know, I, 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 I want to address it. Uh, you're, you're talking about hanging out in Jordan. Now. What's that? Jordanians. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, well, look, there's no doubt that the Palestinians make up 80-some percent of Jordan and... Uh, that you could argue that it is already a Palestinian state, and so why are we bothering uh, talking about a two-state solution when we already have one? The point is, is that there are Palestinians that live in, in the West Bank who have, have a nationalist movement. Whether we uh, appreciate it or not, it is here to stay, and we need to uh, respect that, um, or at least deal with it. Um, now, uh, as for where Jordan is right now, I should just say that, and 
feel free if you guys want to comment on this, but 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 it is Jordan is in, ex, in an extremely precarious place. I met with a Jordanian official this summer who told me that there was zero ISIS problems within the country. And over the last week, I've seen I don't know how many arrests of uh, ISIS activists inside Jordan, people who are being uh, pulled in in the middle of the night, cells that have been uncovered. Um, there is a problem, and I don't know how long it is before Jordan will suffer the same sorts of attacks that have taken place in Canada, for example. It's remarkable that we haven't seen more along those lines uh, in Jordan. Uh, Jordan, I think its third largest city right now, is a refugee camp of Syrians. And this, of course, is very difficult to police, and I think very few people have any idea within that camp itself how many ISIS supporters there are. There's a huge amount of intrigue. So it's a huge security issue. The Israelis are working very closely with the Jordanians, trying to get to the bottom of whatever threats that may be brewing. Uh, but I think Jordan is in a lot of trouble in the, uh, in the long term. I'll just say, I'll just say we'll give a little bit of a, a, a counterpoint, and that is, um, I've heard this from, I've heard this mostly from Israeli analysts and a few Israeli officials, which I think is a very interesting reading. It seems that the Syrian refugee crisis, of course, is a problem. It's a problem for Turkey. It's a problem for Lebanon as well. But it kind of depends on how the, um, how the king how the king manages this problem. Because another way to look at it is the number of Syrian refugees, the more you can dilute the number of Palestinians, the political power of the Palestinians, that's a, that is something that can be used to his advantage. Whether or not the king will be able to do that and to what extent that that will... Uh, that will be able to balance out the real refugee crisis is a different question, but there are, you know, there are options that can be played with there. If point. I could just jump, um, the days of the Jordan option or, or Jordanian involvement in, in the West Bank are gone, except for maybe the uh, Haram al-Sharif, you know, Dome of the Rock and, and symbolic stuff like that. They disengaged in 88, they don't, they don't want to go back because of p potential domestic political implications of, of getting involved there. The, and, then, and so that leaves basically finding a way for Israel and the United States to work with the de facto authorities in the West Bank. What I, what I did when I was working for the um, USSC in Jerusalem was it was, it was um, the tra training of the Palestinian security forces. The, the bottom line is the Israelis, if you ask the Israeli military about those people, they speak very highly of them. They, have a, they, they say they have excellent security cooperation with them and that the situation in the West Bank would be a lot different if it were not for uh, the Palestinian Authority security forces. Right. The bottom line is, sure. just, just the last point, do I, not, do, do I believe that if, if there were a third intifada that some of those guys or many of them would not turn their guns on Israelis? Quite likely. But the point is you have to... It, this is like surfing and living hand to mouth, and you you do what you can with what you have, the material you have to work with, in order to at least you know keep a lid on the situation. And it's worked it's worked very well for over a decade now. Okay, let's um, uh, taking taking the other questions if we can. Let's try to have one response to each of the questions. Uh, next, go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, esteemed panel. Um, I have two questions. My first question, if you turn back the clock a little bit, uh, the U.S., we were doing a deal with Egypt in the middle of uh, the whole crisis there. Did we conclude that deal, and did we give them military-grade aircraft? That's my first question. My second question is, in learning what you said about I Iran expanding, it would be very easy for them to do a clandestine a nuclear program do we have in place a uh, methodology uh, to block that? And if we don't, would Israel step up and block it? Uh, okay. I'll be very, I'll be Hold on. A quick question, and we will be done promptly at 8.30, just so people know. Go ahead. Just very quickly, um, the U.S. replaced the Soviet Union as Egypt's main arms supplier in the late 70s. That was one of the major um, breakthroughs in American policy in the region. It was, it was a great achievement. Um, with regard to nuclear, um, twice Iran has been caught, um, and th as a result, I think they've been very careful. But just because, you know, as we say with investment, past performance is no guarantee of you know future um, you know performance in this regard, and therefore we have to be open to the possibility that we our, our intelligence is flawed, and we know that we know that, and it may not work as well in the future. Next. 
Is it true that the Hamas is rebuilding the tunnels in Gaza? Uh, as best we know, yes. Uh, this is uh, what the Israelis are saying. Uh, look, I would just note this, that there is a huge labyrinth of tunnels that the Israelis did not get at during the Gaza war. Uh, the areas that were deeper into Gaza, the Israelis, of course, created a buffer zone inside Gaza a few uh, kilometers in. They went through and they destroyed what they could find within that buffer zone. There's a lot more that is still there, and they are guaranteed to continue to build out uh, back toward Israel. It's, uh, it's a foregone conclusion. And by the way, we are, um, we are actually uh, uh, going through the radio show. We're taking our 10th listener trip to Israel, uh, leaving after Pesach, so the end of April. And uh, we've had wonderful participation from people from Atlanta, uh, Jews as well as Christians in the past. And uh, I'd encourage everybody to come along. We're going to be posting this um, on our website this week at michaelmedved.com. And one of the things we're going to be looking at is um, uh, going right up and seeing some of the tunnels that uh, the Israeli uh, military was able to uh, decommission. Um, but not all of them, unfortunately. Next. Okay, given that we can't make a statement but must ask a question, given that this government is determined to bring Israel to its knees and doing everything they can to blame Israel for all the problems, given that Biden, Rice, and Kerry refused to even meet with Yalon the other day, what can we do to make our Jewish population understand, really understand the situation as we have the opportunity to go to the polls to do something about it and to um, vote you know, in the people. If you, if you, don't, if you don't mind, let me, let me answer that, um, if I can. Um, uh, by all means, go to the polls. This is a, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. I'm sure that uh, everyone will vote appropriately. Um, and um, <laughs> at least one hopes. But the, the other thing, and this is, this is really, it's one of the most remarkable things. The new Pew study, which I think was pretty good, the study of the Jewish community, suggests that over 70%, nearly three quarters of all American Jews have never been to Israel even once. Now, one thing that you can do is for people that you know, or for yourself, if that's you, who have not been to Israel, or haven't, even if you haven't been to Israel for 10 or 20 years, first of all, so many things have changed, and almost entirely for the better. Israel is amazing, because it is clearly one of those countries in the world where every major city, every standard of living measure, every measure of artistic excellence, of scientific leadership, it grows and multiplies and blossoms every year. So by all means, if you don't come with us on the Medved tour, and you should, um, by all means, make arrangements. Because th there, is, there is no way that anyone can speak as authoritatively about the Middle East as people who have actually been there. And uh, so by all means, uh, do what you can. I, I was speaking recently to one of the people in the, uh, MO, in the Ministry of Tourism, which is uh, appropriately known as MOT, right? Member of the Tribe, Ministry of Tourism. And since the Gaza War, the tourism by evangelical Christians has skyrocketed. It's, it's back up to as high as it ever was. Tourism by American Jews is still down. And, and they're waiting for it to recoup. You can be part of answering that need. And it's, it's something very direct and very personal, and you can do it. Next question. Yes. Um, I have been to Israel, and I was there for three weeks last year. Um, stayed on two different military bases. But, and so I got a new appreciation for Israel and also a special interest for the Middle East since then. But it seems like I watched the Arab Spring take place on TV over a period of a year, whatever period of time it was, but it would seem like when these dictators that were removed during that time from Gaddafi to Mubarak and Assad and Hussein 
when they were in power, there was at least a relative calm in the Middle East. You didn't hear it on the news every night about what was going on. And as you've already stated, there's been hundreds of thousands of people that have been killed since they were removed. But why was our State Department, do you have any idea of the administration in the State Department, get a better handle on who was going to step in and, and take up that vacuum when those dictators were removed? And it seems like it's just been left to, you know, to the Right. Muslim Brotherhood and others that have stepped in and it's become it's, it's a great chaotic. it's a it's a great question So yeah. Lee, what about bringing back right, the yeah, good old it, days it of comes Gaddafi back, well, as we were Saddam talking about Hussein and <laughs> Well, look that the important thing is you need to distinguish the dictators I happen to think Hosni Mubarak is one of the great Arab leaders of the of, of modern times And that is because he managed to keep a chaotic place very still for 30 years might not be a very nice thing to say, but I think he was also acting generally on behalf of U.S. interest. He was an American ally. Bashar al-Assad, on the other hand, as an ally of Iran and as a sponsor and ally of Hezbollah, that's problematic for American interests. So Assad, just because someone is a dictator, they're not all either equally good or equally bad. It really needs to come down on whether or not this person uh, is working on behalf of American interest or is dead set against it. And Assad's stability was not stability at all. If you, again, you look at his support for Hezbollah, especially, uh, especially if you're looking at it, um, if you're looking at it on the Israeli border. Assad was no, uh, was not a friend of stability. You know, I would, if I could just add one thing, I know we wanted to keep you short, but I, I remember, um, and I'll differ with Leah here a little bit, I remember actually going on Bloomberg television the day that Hosni Mubarak fell, and I remember hearing Vice President Joe Biden right on before me saying, you know, where the anchor I said, is uh, Mubarak a dictator? And he said, you know, absolutely not, he's not a dictator. And I remember thinking to myself that that was probably an insult to Hosni Mubarak, who spent 30 years consolidating power. Uh, right? uh, and, you know, look, what, the way I would put this is, is that we, we certainly relied on strongmen, and that was probably a mistake. Uh, in light of the violations of human rights and press freedoms and everything else that took place. I think we did it for a good reason. We were looking for stability. I think the man who had it right, but maybe didn't execute it the right way, was actually George W. Bush. And that's not a terribly popular thing to say these days. But look, what he did is he had an idea for how to democratize. He wanted to use the people that were in place and was pressing them to, to implement more and more reforms. Obviously, it didn't work out that way. We had a couple of failures along the way. The Hamas elections, for example, delivered a blow to the democracy agenda. Uh, and then uh, when the administrations changed, we zeroed out a, a lot of those programs. I still think there's a kernel of wisdom there that I would love to be able to pick up again and pursue. All right, last three questions here. Good evening. Um, please forgive that my question is a topic unto itself, I'm sure, but my British husband and I, who um, met in the United Kingdom in a counterterrorism program in the UK, um, we've watched that country rot over the years, and we've watched the spread of Islamism in that country to proportions that just can't be described. And we are both uh, disgusted personally, socially, politically, by what's happened there, and we're caused We've talked a lot about policies and policymakers over abroad, but we're caused to sort of think about what Western states need to be doing at home when it comes to allowing the proliferation of Islam, Islam, Islamism. So for the sake of brevity, we had written down, can you speak to the um, scale of the impact and the contribution of policies of radical secularism in Europe um, and liberal policies in Western states which allow for Islamic populations to get a cultural grip hold and for social roots to grow. Thanks. I, I... I wrote an article for Tablet Magazine last week looking at the phenomenon of why teenage girls uh, in Europe are running off to join ISIS. And and why also a lot of young men are running off to join ISIS as well. And my conclusion, rather my argument is, I'm not so sure if it's the actual policies that you're talking about. I think it has to do with values. I think it has to do with what you believe. And I think that one of the problems we're seeing in Europe right now is the values that made Europe what it was, um, the values that the United States also stands for, a lot of Europeans are no longer certain about these values. And so I think a lot of, I think a lot of these people, when they see it comes back to my idea of this, or some of bin Laden's idea of the strong horse, um, if people have no faith in their own values, if their own society, 
of their own culture, they can tell who does think their ideas are strong and powerful. And unfortunately, if there are not good ideas, of course ISIS is an exceedingly stupid and vicious institution and idea. Nonetheless, if there are not good ideas and positive and strong values to fill that vacuum, they will be filled with stupid ideas. So that's what I see the problem, not the policies as much as the values that people believe in. Hi, thank you all for being here. Uh, I came here uh, expecting to get my mind cleared on what's going on <laughs> in the Middle East. And I'm going about, uh, away a little more flummoxed than I was when I came in. But um, the, I, w I wanted to kind of expand on the question before me. We have, you, have, you talked about the Middle East being in chaos, and they've been they've been at war before, and it's you know it's never really gotten to anything that we had to worry about. But we have a huge Islamic population moving to the United States, starting to make demands on certain uh, practices and certain behaviors that we as Americans have followed for a long time. And I don't know whether they, because I heard somewhere that they had said that they're just working hard right now and they're uh, setting up their communities, but this is for a future takeover of the United States. And this is frightening, I'm grandmother of eight beautiful children, <laughs> and um, I, I don't, I'm scared. If Are I can, you scared? If I, if I can speak to, the, if I can speak Thank to this, um, I, look, it's a big world with a lot of Muslims in the big world. The numbers that are brooded about, ma'am, you really do have to hear this. The, the Census Bureau of the United States uh, does in the supplementary census, not the long form census, the, uh, uh, but they, not, not in the short form census, but they do a, a, an estimate of, of uh, religious populations. And they have been unable to identify by talking to all of the various mosques and Islamic community organizations more than two million Muslims in the United States. There are Arab Christians in the United States. They're not the same as Muslims, and there are a great many Arab Christians. But the, the numbers that people sometimes use are extremely irresponsible. There are not 10 and 20 million Muslims in America. They're not hiding. And I would be very surprised if any of my colleagues here would say that there is uh, an organized plan or effort or expectation by any Muslim leaders or any Muslim communities to, uh, to take over the United States. It's, it's not today Dearborn, uh, tomorrow the world. Would you, would you agree, gentlemen? Okay. So we have Muslims who serve, we have, we have Muslims who've served their country honorably. Absolutely. I think the idea that somehow that Muslims constitute some fifth column, I'm sorry, I, I think that's not right. And look, when, again, it comes back to the idea of strength. Whenever I hear people talking about how scared they are of Sharia, my point is, you know what, we have laws on the books in this country which forbid people from killing their daughters. So the idea that we need to fight and combat Sharia, I think, is preposterous. We need to believe in our laws and uphold our laws and expect everyone to uphold the same laws. That's all it is. Okay, last, last question. Uh, Naftali Bennett published the Israel Stability Initiative a couple of years ago, and I'm wondering if anyone has an opinion, if either of you guys have an opinion on what he wrote. Um, I'm afraid I don't know enough to answer, to answer intelligently. Um, Look, we're, we're, we're very much in favor of Israel. We're very much in favor of civility. And if you're talking about an Israel civility um, issue, this, by the way, I was talking before about what has improved in Israel. My brother went to live in Israel 26 years ago. My brother made Aliyah 26 years ago. All of his children um, 
Uh, one, one is currently a tank commander in Golan, and uh, the others have, have done their military service. And so we, we go very regularly. It is dramatic to see that Israel, uh, d despite the fact that it's a little bit of a shock for Americans from a nice, pleasant place like Atlanta to come and see, Israelis are not good at waiting in line. This is not, this is not one of the great national attributes that Israelis have. Uh, as we were saying before, Jews generally are not laid back, easygoing, um, uh, let alone people. We're passionate people. One of the, my favorite Israel stories is on one of our tours, um, at one point a bus driver unfortunately got, got lost and there was a huge argument that developed at a street corner with people arguing about the best way to give us instructions to find our way back to... And uh, Israelis can argue about everything. However, having said that, I think it's, it's unmistakable that the levels of civility and, and the ability um, of, of most Israelis, not all, but most Israelis to actually get along and, uh, and, and see the amazing miracle and blessing of that country's growth and prosperity has been uh, quite remarkable. You've been quite remarkable and patient as well. Please pick up your In Focus, uh, find out more about Jewish Policy Center, and we'll be speaking with you in front with our books moments from now.